Welcome to another edition of RCE. Again, this is Brock Palin. You can find us online at rce-cast.com. Also, feel free to jump over to iTunes or your other favorite podcatcher and be sure to leave a review. This makes the podcast more visible to others. There's also a nomination form on the website where we've recently had some contact from users um, giving recommendations of other places, and actually the show today is an example of one. Uh, once again, I have Jeff Squire from Cisco Systems and one of the authors of OpenMPI. Jeff, thanks a lot for your time. Hey, Brock. Uh, it is a busy time for everybody, right? Uh, so as we're recording today, um, there is a Euro MPI conference going on. There's an MPI forum conference going on. They're going to go hand in hand. We got supercomputing coming up in a couple of months. Um, what's going on in your neck of the woods? Um, yeah, so I will also be at supercomputing, drop by the Michigan booth and come see some of our recent um, advancements and hardware we've put on the floor. But uh, next week, uh, probably about the time this goes out, I will also be at the Frontiers in Computing and Data Science, a little mini conference that's free that's held by Michigan State University. It's their second year of doing it. Uh, it's, it's very nice. It's organized by their new uh, computational sciences department. And actually the week after that, October 10th and 11th, there will be an academic medical forum, IT forum, um, held at the University of Michigan. I will also be there. Uh, you actually get a tour of our HPC data center um, that Monday. And that's also a free conference, so uh, come by and see me there. Cool. All right. Well, today, as you were talking about, this was a user-suggested topic, and I think we actually do have an award-winning category here because we have the most number of people we have ever interviewed at once. We have four people from this particular project. So, Brock, tell us what we got today. Yeah, so we have a little bit of a dining philosopher's problem here with, with four guests plus two hosts on the phone. So this is the most we've ever done. Everyone's in a different location. But the guests today are representing the Julia Project, julialang.org. Um, guys, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Hi, uh, thanks for having us. So I'm Jeff Bizanson. Uh Let's see, I recently finished a PhD at MIT. Uh, I'm mostly interested in compilers and programming languages, and I have a little bit of background in scientific and research programming. It's part of what got me started on this. Hi, uh, Alan Edelman here. Glad to be here as well. I've been a professor at MIT for 20 years in applied math and in computer science lab. And um, I'm interested in the whole range from numerical algorithms all the way to making... Uh, scientific computing and technical computing run faster and easier. Yeah, I'm Stefan Karpinski. Uh, yeah, I uh, you know used to work as a data scientist. Um, I learned MATLAB from Varal, who's going to introduce himself next. And uh, you know we we got into this because we felt like we could do something something good for data science, something good for numerical computing, a language that we could uh, use for all the things we like doing. Yeah, hi. Uh, this is Viral Shah. Um, you know, I've, I've known all these guys for a very long time now, and I personally have a PhD in uh, in computer science and computational sciences from the University of California at Santa Barbara. And uh, you know, when we met up, we started talking about Julia. And this is, you know, I, I come from the scientific computing world, and uh, you know, it's just what I love doing, and that's what all of us are doing today. So the, uh, Jeff and Stefan and myself are also co-creators of Julia Computing along with Alan. But while Alan is still uh, driving the research at MIT, the three of us are co-founders of Julia Computing. Okay, so what exactly is Julia? Julia is a programming language. Uh, it's a general purpose programming language. Uh, but we were motivated by the kinds of problems that people have in technical computing. Uh, and the kinds of programs people write in MATLAB and Python, NumPy, and in R. Um, and we, we looked at that world and looked at our own experiences in it uh, and, and decided that a new language design was really necessary. The way I like to describe it is uh, Julia is something like a Python or an R or a MATLAB when you first come to see it so that it's easy to start using. Uh, but under the hood, it's something very, very different. It's much more powerful. Okay, so when you say it's something like these languages, what do you mean by that? Do you mean syntactically or grammatically, or what do you mean? What I tend to mean is that when people come to Julia, they feel pretty much at home. They feel like they're ready to use it. You know, once you get past the, the square brackets or semicolons or a couple of other things, usually people are quite at home. 
Yeah, so sometimes it, people get hung up on one based indexing and zero based indexing, but like Alan said, you know, it, it all sort of disappears in the background once you once you start using it. So just for the record, which one are you? Zero or one based indexing? There's a funny story um, there. <laughs> We, we are technically one-based indexing. Uh, we, I mean, we started out as one-based indexing, um, but you know, today you can pretty much do much more than one-based indexing as of the latest Julia release. My colleague Ron Rivest uh, says that, that wars have been fought over lesser things. He, he, he thinks he has the solution. We should all go to one-half-based indexing and leave it at that. <laughs> that sounds like a perfect <laughs> solution to me. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that the the what. What Alan to expand on what Alan's saying about uh, people feeling comfortable is that the the syntax is is you know superficially similar to MATLAB, so you can often translate MATLAB code to Julia just by changing a few parentheses to square brackets for indexing into arrays and and not really changing too much else. Um, but you know the semantics are sort of closest probably to Python. It's very straightforward, dynamic language to use. But then there's sort of this rabbit hole of advanced features that you can go down that you don't need to know about right away to get into to, to write useful programs, but which can help you as you you find yourself doing harder and harder things. And indeed, what happens when you start to go down this rabbit hole is you become a better programmer. Something that when you've used these other languages, you never knew you, you were missing and, and never knew you wanted to be. But then when you do it, you wonder how you lived without it. Okay, so you've already mentioned uh, Python and MATLAB. Um, and, you know, we have Python and R as examples of open source, uh, you know, interpretive languages, as well as MATLAB as an example of a scientific but closed source one. Um, so why do we need a new one? Well, I think uh, one thing is that to us, uh, the key is to get the core abstractions really right. Um, and also, I, to us, technical computing is largely about functions, essentially, uh, and not just any functions. The, uh, the functions that arise uh, in this domain actually tend to be quite complex uh, and have many definitions and many notions of them. Uh, and that's kind of what programs are built out of, and that's sort of what we observed. Uh, so we wanted a language that had a generic function-based paradigm rather than the popular class-based OO paradigm that's found in Python, for instance, which is good for many things. Uh, but we felt in this domain you really wanted generic functions where things are more function-based rather than object-based. Sure. So a generic function is a function that has many definitions. Uh, so basically, uh, you, can, uh, you, add, uh, you add new methods to a function rather than adding it to an object. Uh, so you have a single function, uh, and over time, as new types are defined or as new cases are identified, you add other definitions to that function. Uh, and then when the function is called, uh, there's a system for selecting uh, which definition to call. Basically, you select the most specific uh, matching definition. So it, it, I was going to say it gives you roughly the same kind of dispatch of selecting different pieces of code that you get in object-oriented programming, uh, but kind of turned on a, in a different direction where it's, it's, it's from a per function perspective rather than from a kind of noun and object based perspective. If I could interject briefly regarding um, the broad question of why another language, there's, there's two things I'd quickly like to say. Um, one is that it's really not a competition. I mean, we're pretty friendly with the various other communities who go to their conferences. They come to, to ours. Uh, but one rather different design that, that's worth bringing up is that uh, languages uh, like, like the ones we mentioned tend to be uh, a, a kind of script over C or, or some other fast language where uh, while Julia does use other languages, it's primarily Julia all the way down. And uh, that has very different implications. So let's, let's dive right into that. So, um, that is the typical constraint, right? Is with NumPy and other things like that, you, you have nice abstractions in, in the target language itself, but under the covers, it very quickly turns into C for speed or sometimes even Fortran, um, something that can be you know, utilized for its typically numerical efficiency in, in various types of computation. Um, you mentioned two important things there. One... Uh, you mentioned the whole speed thing itself, and so we'd like to understand how, as an interpreted language, does Julia achieve its speed? And two, 
it's Julia all the way down. That would be let's let's dive into that when you're done with the first question. Well, the, I guess the the Julia all the way down. I'm, I'll address first, just because it's a kind of a good lead in. Um, you know, the we started out when we first started implementing Julia. It was it was not particularly fast because you know you everything starts as baby steps. Um, but we kept ourselves to this discipline of don't implement, don't resort to implementing things in C just because it happens to be faster right now. So figure out how to implement the thing in Julia and then work on the Julia compiler and library and all of the pieces that you need to make sure that that thing is fast enough. And we, we keep ourselves to that discipline to this day. Um, you know, there's, there's times when it makes sense to just call, uh, you know, a BLOSS library because, you know, we're not going to, we, we have better things to do with our time than re-implement BLOSS. Um, but, you know, you, it, it just makes sense to to implement it in the language and, and go with that. Okay, so when you say that you've implemented a bunch of things in, in terms of Julia, I mean, somewhere down underneath, it has to turn into assembly language. I mean, what is what is the crossover point? Is there a small little core of C or do you have a Julia to assembly compiler? How, how does that work? Yes. Yeah. Well, we compile the native code uh, using LLVM. Yeah. The LLVM compiler tool chain lets us uh, basically generate in, you know, use a C++ API to <coughs> describe the instructions we want to execute and then say, give me a function, give me a machine, give me the machine code for this. Uh, and then you get the machine code and you jump right into it and you execute right away. Um, and, and LLVM is just a phenomenal library for this. It you know cuts down on the amount of time and nonsense involved in implementing a new language in to you know by by a decade or something like that. Is sometimes people wonder that you know can't I just take this LLVM and sprinkle it over my you know favorite language of choice today? And often the answer comes you know at the answer is no because. You know, what, what makes it possible for Julia to go from that very high level, fun to use, you know, programming language down to the, you know, the tightest assembly is Julia's language design. And I would suggest that people who want to, you know, know about it in a great amount of detail, either look at our paper uh, that's going to appear in Siam Review or Jeff's PhD thesis. Well, that's a very good point, Viral, that, that it, it's not just like, you can have a JIT or you could have LLVM and your favorite language can be fast. You need all of those pieces from top to bottom to somehow fit together like a glove to get the speed. I sometimes like to give the analogy that one, you know, one, 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 one mistake in a computation, like one arithmetic error, can kill the correctness of an entire program. The same with, with performance. You need, you need everything to work together from top to bottom to achieve performance. And, and that, that ties back into what I was saying earlier about starting out with the premise that we're going to implement everything top to bottom in this one language. So we can't take any shortcuts and be like, oh, no, no, don't worry, that'll be done in C. A, a good example is so, you know, integers don't have to be that fast in a high level language like, you know, Python or R because your for loops are implemented in C or C++. But in our case, our integers have to be fast because our for loops are implemented in Julia. And so you can't, you know, you, you have to make different decisions. You have to, you know, and people don't always like this, but our integers are machine integers and they overflow. Um, and, and, you know, that's, that's something that coming, people coming from Python are surprised by because Python has big ints everywhere. Um, but we can't afford to do that because we're actually building everything all the way from the bottom up. So, so the, the word on the street is that, uh, to sum this kind of up, is that Julia solves the two language problem, or technically that's Oosterhout's dichotomy. Uh, but that's kind of the way it's been described to, 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 to categorize the whole story. So you've talked a lot about performance. What, you know, interpretive languages, scripting languages tend to have a bad reputation, but you know, one of your big use cases is your performance versus a lot of scientific use cases and these other scripting languages. How exactly does Julia compare? So I'll, I'll address that briefly. Uh, so interpreting versus compiling is actually a, a language implementation feature. So it, pretty much any language can be either interpreted or compiled. Um, 
So it's, it's actually, as you know, Julia, you start it up and you can type to it interactively uh, like scripting languages, uh, but actually underneath it is in fact compiling code much of the time. Uh, so you'll sometimes you'll type something and we'll compile it and then run the compiled code. We so have, it's interactive, but still compiled. We, we have tons of performance comparisons. You can find them everywhere. Most recently in my graduate course, uh, Problem Set 1, I told the students to, to write a program in Julia for the first time from, for most of them and, and then take your favorite language. Uh, everybody's an expert on, on one of them um, and compare. And I've seen everything from factors of seven to 40,000 uh, reported back to me. And it's all over the, across the board, depending on how they did it and what they were doing. So an interesting variation on this is that uh, there are there are sort of there are very fast uh, lang you know JIT compiled implementations of dynamic languages like JavaScript. So JavaScript really sort of you know it wasn't the first one, but it was the first really mainstream one with the the, the Google V8 engine, uh, and that really proved that you can do this. Um, but w the Julia's implementation is actually pretty different than that because. You know, the, we're not bolting on a JIT to a dynamic language that was not really designed with the thought of performance in mind. We got the benefit of starting from scratch and thinking about every single decision from the, you know, from the ground up about in terms of performance. And as a result, Julia actually has to do far fewer tricks. We don't really have to do anything particularly crazy to get good performance. And in fact, we're closer to Ahead, an ahead of time compiled language like C++ or something like that, um, dis despite being dynamic, which is it's an interesting trade off. Let me interject a question here. So um, the, the traditional arguments in high performance computing kinds of scenarios and technical computing scenarios is Fortran versus C and or C++. Right. And, and Fortran, although a lot of computer scientists kind of deride it or make fun of it, is fantastic for what it was intended for, which is numerical computation. And it's absolutely terrible at other things like string manipulation, and it does a passable job at file manipulation, but only in a fairly basic sense. C, on the other hand, is, is relatively good, and C++ is better at uh, those other kinds of things, but it has many more pitfalls that uh, you can easily fall into. Where does kind of Julia fit in this? I don't even want to call it a two-dimensional spectrum because I'm, I'm really kind of talking about a bunch of different things here. But, you know, in terms of uh, technical computing, you've, you've emphasized how you designed it from the ground up for speed. But where do you fall on the side of system-level things that you need in order to support that technical computing, to load your input and save the output, all, all those kinds of things. So, so uh, I like to tell this story when uh, I've been in the high performance computing world for a while, and I think it was over a decade ago, I visited the uh, world's fastest supercomputer at the time, the Earth Simulator, um, in a, a suburb of, of Tokyo, Japan. And I had this best tour, this, this fellow gave me this wonderful tour of the whole place, and I asked him, how do you program this machine? And my tour guide, he kind of paused and kind of let out this little smile. And he said that, you know, in Japan, we really respect our elders. So that's why we program all in Fortran. So the reason I tell this story is uh, because in my graduate course, lots of young fellows, you know, uh, uh, men and women, I asked them, what do you program in now? And uh, have anybody has anybody programmed in Fortran? And the answer is no. So uh, we see this as as kind of an art that's not staying current much longer, at least from my point of view. Um, I, I've actually found that the occasionally the the syntactic uh, similarities between Julia and Fortran are are uncanny. Um, they're accidental. I don't think any of us has really done any earnest Fortran programming. But the difference is that you know in, to, in Fortran 2011 or whatever the latest standard is, the the core problem often looks a lot like a bit of Julia code. It's this sort of like high level vectorized expression that goes down and you know does the, the computation very efficiently. But it's prefaced by two pages of type declarations explaining exactly what the layout and types and everything of the problem are, whereas in Julia, it's just that one line. 
and that is enough to express the computation efficiently. Actually, we had uh, what is I think uh, in one of the libraries, maybe it was Amos, where someone just took uh, the Fortran descriptions and wrote a pretty trivial, um, you know, a pretty trivial translation of it to Julia, and I think the code was like maybe like fifty lines or something. Another point, uh, Stefan mentioned that we're not going to translate the the Blas or LAPAC or, or very popular Fortran libraries. But interestingly enough, the thought experiment has circulated that if we did take the time to translate it, we believe we would be as fast, possibly even faster for some things and, and, and more general as well. Uh, but it's a project that doesn't seem to be high on the priority list. Okay, so we focused a lot on the performance, but we haven't expressed anything in terms of other performance we we're interested in, in scientific and even non-scientific stuff. I mean, my laptop here has four cores and a desktop might have six, eight, twelve. Um, does Julia expose parallelism? And if so, is it implicit, like it's you've implemented threading for some performance-sensitive functions, or is it explicit, such as you know threads or message passing? Right. So we've had distributed memory parallelism in the standard library from the beginning, actually, which is a multiprocessing implementation uh, where we just start up multiple instances of the system and they can pass messages between each other. Uh, the API for that is not really similar to MPI. Uh, it's more similar to an RPC kind of mechanism. Uh, so we've had that for a while. And then uh, just recently, uh, we're adding some experimental support for shared memory multi-threading. Yeah, the, I should also I, add that there is uh, MPI support uh, that has been added as, an, as a package. So while base Julia ships with uh, RPC style programming, um, MPI has been added as a first class package in the language and there's tons of MPI libraries that are now plugged into Julia. So you could do your distributed dense linear algebra, sparse linear algebra, and uh, you know, bunch of pet C stuff and just about anything else. Uh, including writing Julia plus MPI as if, you know, just like you would have written, Ju uh, you know, C plus MPI or something. Indeed, my graduate course is all about the various ways of doing parallelism, uh, all of the above, including GPU parallelism and, and other kinds of special hardware. And the, 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 the motto that uh, has been emerging from the class has been, don't bring your algorithms to the hardware, to the high-performance hardware. Bring your language to the high-performance hardware. So we keep asking over and over again, how is it that you can try your best to use uh, the same code, possibly with, with minor modifications or, or possibly none at all, ideally, um, and work on lots of different kinds of parallelism at, at once? Um, it's not been the tradition in high-performance computing, but in the end, uh, I believe that this is what's needed for, for high-performance computing to get to the next level. Wait, so so I want to um, inject something there you said. So you mentioned GPU and bringing your language to the hardware. Um, FPGA, Xeon Phi's, how exactly do you do that? Like, do you have to inject something into the runtime? Or, like, say I have some customized piece of hardware that's really good at expressing specifically molecular dynamics methods or something like that, something a little higher level. How would I actually inject that into Julia so it... Uh, describes that base hardware. So on a, on a GPU, one could, for example, um, emit CUDA on the other end, um, but the user could be typing Julia or Julia-like syntax. That's actually the subject of today's lecture. So a big piece of this is that as people add support in LLVM for different types of hardware, we get a lot of that benefit for free. So there's, there's sort of two pieces to it. There's the as as people add LLVM backends and can emit code for different GPU architectures, Xeon Phi, etc. Uh, and the Xeon Phi is really a sort of it's sort of a strange Pentium with you know with lots of cores and extra wide instructions. Um, and as as long as you have you know GPU uh, or uh, you know a, a, a compiler backend that can address that, you're you're fine. You're good to go. Um, GPUs are a little harder because they're not completely general purpose. But there's a huge amount of good work that's been done on getting Julia to just run run generic code on GPUs. So let me let me dive down into that because 
Um, you can look at this uh, two different things in the same way under the broad nomenclature of architecture, for example. I think that's actually a fascinating point that you bring out that LLVM is picking up support for new types of hardware and you quote unquote get that for free. I'm, I'm sure it's not entirely for free, but you leverage all of that work into your own, which is totally cool. How does that, though, uh, represent itself in terms of uh, the underlying topology? Because it's not just enough to support the instruction set of the GPU or the instruction set of the Phi, which is nominally the same as, as the, the big heavy lifting Xeons and so on. Um, but what about the architecture in terms of knowing that like, oh, this thing is across a PCI bus, and so I need to choose how I access it. Rather than just running stuff, I've got to move things around, and that takes time, and that implies a different pipelining model. All these kinds of uh, architecture and topology issues, how does that figure in there? Yeah, so I, I don't think we have a silver bullet for this yet. Um, but I, I, one thing that I've observed uh, is that often with this, these kinds of hardware, uh, simply the mechanics of accessing it can be very difficult. Uh, you have to learn a lot, a lot of different tools and kind of put things together uh, and learn how the, the different worlds talk to each other. Uh, so I, we think first by uh, integrating access to these things in a really nice way so that the, the effort to try running something on a GPU, uh, say, is just as low as possible, uh, then it makes it a lot easier to experiment with and people can try making libraries uh, that solve these kinds of problems. Yeah, along those lines, I think that for you know, compiler writers, we want Julia to be as much of a great scripting language on top of LLVM as possible. And it already is really, I mean, there's one angle that you look at the language and you're like, wow, this is an incredible scripting language for LLVM. Um, and, and so then you can immediately try out these things for free that you get with LLVM and just minimum effort. Um, and I think that's necessary in an area where, you know, we really, as a collectively as a whole, have not yet figured out the best way to program to GPUs, to, you know, large distributed supercomputers. We have some ways to do it, but we don't have the best way yet, I don't think. Well, we, we do have, um, you know, annotations for code, right, um, that we use, call, you know, so we have act parallel that is used to tell the compiler and the runtime system that, you know, these iterations of this loop are in parallel. Or act simd, which, you know, tries to, uh, to you know, find instruction level parallelism um, in, in the code that's generated. And, the, you know, as, as, new and, as newer backends get added to LLVM, these same kinds of constructs could be reused going forward. I personally find that, you know, if I wrote my code in Julia and it could run on on the CPU, on the GPU, on the Knight's Landing, um, you know, the, the Xeon Phi, uh, the, the thing that comes after the Xeon Phi, if I could write my code at a high level in Julia and, and have it compiled down to these architectures, I don't mind the extra, you know, mental... Um, a challenge of figuring out, hey, take this chunk of data, send it out there, and then just run this Julia function there. Usually it's, you know, cross-compiler stuff, like writing a bit in Julia, and then another bit in C, and then something in Python. That That's kind of the hard part. But once it's all available in Julia, it's, it's easy to just say, hey, copy this data to the GPU, run it in Julia there, bring it back, you know, do this thing on the CPU, and, and so on and so forth. Now, does the same kind of concepts also apply to networking, because I would imagine, I, I really don't know a lot about the guts of LLVM, but though LLVM does not directly interface with networking stacks, and there are many these days um, for all the different types of networking out there, do you foresee LLVM and or Julia going that direction, or are you going to continue to rely on external libraries, for example, like MPI, to give you the multi-network support? So the basic stuff that we use is TCP IP. So if you, if you download Julia 0.5 from our downloads page today and you try to you know, do parallel computing with Julia, it will allow you to use you know, shared memory on the same machine um, or multi-threading. And then if you want to go across nodes, you're going to get essentially TCP IP under the hood. Um, the way to go across these things is, is uh, currently people use the MPI package that we have that I talked about earlier. Often the MPI implementations are tuned for the hardware under the hood, and that's the easiest way to leverage you know, all the kinds of networks that are coming up. 
Um, but we also have one more thing uh, that has been done and not uh, widely recognized, which is um, our cluster manager framework. So our cluster manager framework allows you to sort of implement different transports and different sort of behaviors for Julia uh, for different kinds of clusters. So you could totally take, you know, an InfiniBand cluster and uh, override Julia's cluster manager with, uh, you know, with something that's InfiniBand specific. I, I think that a lot of people these days are using MPI as sort of uh, a, a, a transport layer that happens to be really carefully tuned. Um, they're not necessarily using the MPI high-level interface to get their data all over the place. Some people still are, but to some extent, it's just the best way to get data between machines. Um, and I, I'd like to see that decoupled in the future. Um, I, I think there's no real reason why you should care so much about what the low level, the, 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 I mean, MPI is both of these things, right? It's this low level transport piece. And then it's also this high level programming paradigm piece. And, you know, I think those things should really be decoupled in the future. And I think we're headed in that direction. It's it's funny that you say that actually because I I work at Cisco right and so it's a very large uh, networking and server company and so depending on whether you call MPI a, a high level abstraction or a low level abstraction very much depends on who you're talking to. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned that in the end you're leveraging LLVM for the system level stuff, but what is the actual Julia interpreter the front end itself implemented in? Ah, so we actually use uh, several languages ourselves. So despite talking about the two-language problem and wanting to solve it, we actually use multiple languages. Uh, but, you know, you use the right tool for the job. Uh, so actually, we have a compiler front end uh, that, believe it or not, is written in Scheme, uh, which does parsing and some of the initial lowering passes. Uh, and then from there, uh, we, there are some compiler components that are written in Julia. Actually, the, the part that does type inference uh, is implemented in Julia itself. Uh, and then since LLVM is a C++ API, uh, the code generator is written in C++. So um, what about interacting with other languages? You, you've mentioned this and that you tried to do a, a Julia first and you know fix their performance issues rather than just slapping it on top. But what if I have some well-developed package um, and I want to hook it into Julia, how difficult or easy is it to kind of make a Julia package that calls something external and translate between the data structures? It's generally very, generally very, very easy. Uh, yeah, we care a lot about interop. Uh, we do a lot about it. Uh, so C calling, uh, you know, C is kind of the standard uh, ABI that everything works with. So that, that's, that's kind of the common currency. Uh, so we've had C calling uh, from very early. Uh, which LLVM makes it easy to do. So you can call C functions directly with no overhead. Uh, and then that also gives you uh, Fortran right away. Uh, and then since uh, C Python, uh, of course, has a C API, so that also then uh, opens the door to calling Python. And so packages have been made for, for doing that. So that the Python interop is very good at this point also. And people have gone ahead and also implemented um, interop with R and Java, which are considerably different, but also work reasonably well. <laughs> I kind of embarrassed myself because uh, I never managed to figure out how to use MEX files in MATLAB, even though I'd been using MATLAB for decades. Uh, but with Julia, I call C and Fortran all the time without issue. So along those lines, with these you know, uh, integrations into other languages and whatnot, can you describe some projects that are actually using Julia? I, I kind of like to joke, I was at a MIT retreat among computer scientists where um, the Person, the professor before me was talking about how Julia was being used all over the world by non. Uh, sorry, but uh, his app was being used all over the world by non-technical people, and I got up there and said that I was amazed how many people right here in our lab were using Julia. That always impresses me more than when people are using it all over the world. Um, and um, Julia is being used for everything and everything. I mean, we could give you a very very long list. Wasn't wasn't there a robotics lab right next to the Julia lab at MIT that you didn't even realize was using Julia? The story is even worse. The, the the office was on the other side of my wall. If I had drilled a hole, I would have seen them using Julia, but I didn't know about it until months later at the JuliaCon. 
Yeah, so I, I think the biggest killer app for Julia so far has been um, this optimization library called Jump. Um, and it's hard to describe what exactly it is because what it really is is it's a unified front-end language for describing optimization problems, constrained linear optimization problems in such a way that you can swap out different back-ends by just changing a single line of code. Um, and that's an incredibly empowering thing in that area, and that's become a really de facto standard to use Jump um, with different back-ends in optimization. Uh, and, and that's one of the reasons why we're seeing a lot of Julia used in in different types of, you know, in robotics because you need to do a lot of constrained optimization. Uh, it's also being used by uh, the FAA to develop their next generation air traffic control system. Um, so the, the language for both defining what the spec is and actually having an implementation of that spec generated from or from the spec itself all that is done, Julia, using metaprogramming and using, you know, the amazing facilities of Jump to do this kind of optimization that you need to make sure things don't collide with each other. So, so while Jump is a uh, language for optimization written in Julia, what I'm hearing more and more is that uh, in lots of other communities in robotics and machine learning, uh, in all kinds of science and engineering applications, people are saying they want to create a jump-like language so that it's, it, it's, the, it, it's the metaprogramming that's uh, generating a lot of excitement uh, in, in areas that have nothing to do with optimization, but, but the technology is, is working for them. And to add to those kinds of uh, use cases, we also have um, you know, a, a very quick and rapid adoption of Julia um, on Wall Street, where finance firms are using it, uh, you know, for portfolio optimization or trading algorithms, um, you know, calculating risk, all kinds of stuff. And, uh, you know, that's obviously the kind of thing that Julia Computing focuses on and, and works with our customers on. Yeah, so one of the, the things that drives people to try Julia um, and, and then they find that it's really the only game in town is if you really, really need a huge amount of performance, but also a huge amount of productivity. So obviously there's languages where you can get great performance like C++ and Fortran, and there's extremely productive languages like you know Python and R where you can just sort of write a couple of high-level lines of code and get amazing stuff to work. But if you need both of those things at the same time, there's not a lot of games in town except for Julia. So you kind of had a vision when you launched out to create Julia, but what is the strangest use case you found Julia being used for? Um, something that you didn't expect. Honestly, we did not expect it to replace C++ as much as it has. Um, you know, and I, I think it, in retrospect, it made a lot of sense because, you know, C++ programmers love performance. Uh, they love operator overloading. Um, and, you know, they they... They really, they sort of have this, you know, they, they like method of overloading too and those, in, and templates. Those are sort of the, the features of C++ that the programmers really don't want to give up. And Julia has good answers for all of those because we have parametric types, we have good performance, um, you know, and, and it's, it's just sort of a, a good drop-in replacement for a lot of things. Um, I think, you know, that's, that's sort of the, the biggest surprise to me. You know, I was personally surprised uh, when I saw the FAA guys, uh, you know, the, the folks at Johns Hopkins Laboratory and, uh, um, and Lincoln Labs using Julia for the advanced collision avoidance system for the FAA. Um, this was, they started using Julia way back, like in 2012 almost, when it was announced. And, you know, given the critical nature of that project and the needs for performance and the memory footprint and, and all these other constraints, I mean, it was really surprising that, you know, even after like looking at all the other alternatives, they decided going ahead with Julia and that too at such an early stage. So I, it, it's one of my favorite uh, use cases. Yeah, I think they had a lot of foresight. They really thought very deeply about what their problem was and what kind of properties a language needed to have. Um, and, and it's really interesting that their conclusion was this Julia language seems like it really has what we need. Um, which was, you know, metaprogramming and great performance. 
I think if somebody asked me what my biggest surprise was, it would be almost psychological. I, I guess I kind of grew up thinking that, oh, all languages are the same. You know, a Turing machine, you can, you know, you, 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 you can, um, you know, anything could be implemented in anything sort of thing. And, and, and by the way, I know what the language that I know best, so I'm never going to change, you know. And then people tried Julia and, uh, oh, this isn't so bad. I can do this. And, and it's that very kind of psychology that, that, you know, I thought we were going to build this language and, you know, we'd have fun with it, but, you know, it might just end there. What license is Julia distributed under? Uh, we use the MIT license for most things. Okay. And then a, a follow-up question to that, which is uh, not really related, but sometimes related. I always like to ask this to other development projects that we talk to here on the program is what source control management system do you use and why? Uh, we, we use Git, and it's it's because uh, Stefan suggested it many years ago and sort of forced us all to use it, and I'm glad he did. Yeah, there was a little bit of kicking and screaming early on about Git because Git Git doesn't have the doesn't have the best learning curve, but then once you learn to use it as a power user, it's you know it's hard to imagine living without it. Um, I I also got us on GitHub pretty early, back when GitHub wasn't really you know ubiquitous and cool. Um, and that was a good choice as well. Um, I think GitHub has been sort of the larger thing in driving the community, which I, I personally don't think would have happened as fast as it did, um, you know, without all the amazing collaborative features that GitHub offers. I mean, maybe it would have, but I think it certainly helped a lot. So what's coming into the future for Julia? Any big changes coming? New features? This current release is actually uh, a pretty phenomenal release. Um, I've been working on a blog post for it, and you know, blog posts are they're uh, they're way more work to write than you think they're going to be. Um, but but it's coming along pretty well. Um, there's a lot of changes to functional programming. Uh, so in the past, Julia has been it's always been technically a functional language in the sense that you can pass functions around and return them from, from other functions and stuff like that. And lambdas are supported. Um, but this is the first release where you can really do all of that without any overhead. Uh, so you can now use functional programming in all of the contexts where you want to use Julia because it's such a high performance language. Um, and, and that's been, you know, Jeff, Jeff did most of that, most of the spearheading of that work and it's, you know, re remarkable stuff. Um, I, there's a, a number of other changes. Uh, uh, I, I'm, I, I'm going to finish that blog post up today and post it. Maybe you can put a link on the website or something to, to link to that. But, uh, I don't know. Were there any other features in the, in the new release that you guys want to talk about or feature stuff? Yeah, I wanted to speak a little bit about, you know, I'm, I'm always sort of excited on about running Julia on multiple new architectures. And, you know, this was the first release where we have had, uh, I would say, pretty good support for ARM, which means Julia is now running on Raspberry Pis. And, you know, the folks out at Berkeley are, are using our ARM implementation to, you know, do drift parking in model cars and all kinds of fun stuff. And this release also saw our first uh, port to Power 8 which means you could now start running Julia on all the big iron, um, and many of those two top 500 sites. So, so going forward, I think these two architectures are definitely going to have, um, you know, they're going to mature a lot more. And uh, hopefully we'll have also have our GPU port uh, coming out uh, in the next few months uh, that's been actively worked upon uh, by Tim Basard and Valentin Shurvi. We should yeah, put a out for the self-driving car. I just love watching that little... No, I don't know what it is, a 15-second movie or whatever it is, but I love it. Yeah, the self-driving car thing is really cool. Um, another big feature is, uh, this is still experimental, but we have native multi-threading support in Julia. So you can just put at threads on a for loop and get uh, that completely parallelized. Uh, and, and it scales. It does the sort of the smart stuff with splitting up the work and allocating it appropriately. So it's not, you know, it's not a lot of the, you know, you don't spin a thousand threads up for eight cores. Um, that is still experimental, but I mean, we have a roadmap plan to get to 1.0 Julia next year. Um, and that will include multi-threading. 
And, and that, I think that's really, really key. That's going to be an exciting feature because having access to first class, high quality, high performance multi-threading mm-hmm. in a dynamic scripting language is, you know, that's going to be revolutionary. I also want to add again, uh, you know, I, I think this release has been phenomenal, like Stefan said. Uh, we've also had our first um, um, a first table release that supports the Julia debugger, uh, which is called Gallium, written by Keno Fisher. Um, it's a side story, but Keno actually started working on Julia in high school, um, and he's now one of the co-founders of Julia Computing. Um, so this Julia release has the first debugger that has been put out, and He's done some amazing integration with uh, Mozilla's, uh, you know, RR framework that allows some phenomenal kinds of debugging capabilities um, that I haven't seen in many other, uh, you know, similar languages. So there's a lot of that kind of stuff coming out over the next few months. Yeah, we we joke about how Keno lives in the Kenoverse, which is like, you know, three to four years ahead of the rest of the universe. He always has this like amazing technology that he's able to use and has developed that eventually, you know, we get pieces of it that trickle back to the rest of us. And, you know, it's always mind blowing stuff. And I think the, the debugger sort of fits into that category. He wrote this amazing, um, C plus plus bindings library, which lets you just dynamically call C plus plus in the REPL from Julia, um, and completely seamlessly integrate C plus plus libraries with, with Julia libraries, which is a, it's a, it's a tour de force. It's really impressive stuff. Um, and this time traveling debugger is going to be, it's going to blow people's minds. Yeah. One, one way to think about it is, is airplanes have black boxes, which I gather they're really orange in the real world. Um, now every bit of software can have, um, sort of the, the 2016 version of, you know, what went right and what went wrong with everything. Yeah. And we, we plan to integrate all of this technology into our, uh, our Julia Box web platform. So we've been offering this uh, free service where you can go to juliabox.org previously, now juliabox.com because the company is, is hosting it. And we are unfortunately going to have to charge people some money at some point. Um, but we'll, we'll try to keep a free, a free tier. But one of the key things there is to be, you know, a lot of these te- pieces of technology are hard to set up locally. Uh, so the best way to get access to it often is to go to a web service where, you know, you already have C++ integration and you already have a debugger, a time traveling debugger set up for you and you can just use it right out of the box. So can you give us a little bit of overview? What exactly is the business model and services provided by Julia Computing? Yeah, so um, our business model is, uh, you know, like uh, very much of a traditional open source business. Um, So we provide consulting and training and support for various, um, you know, forms of Julia, which is we have the Julia Professional Edition, which is what someone could, you know, download. It brings you a beautiful IDE. It brings you all the widely used Julia packages and, and easy to install you know, works behind the firewall, all that other stuff um, for for a sort of a small support fee every year. And then over and above that, we do consulting and training uh, services that help uh, customers get, you know, running with Julia quickly or write some custom modules. Uh, we've been, in, uh, you know, we've been quite lucky in having customers who've actually uh, hired us for consulting work um, to work on open source software and release it back. Um, you know, so the debugger is, uh, for example, an outcome of one of those things, um, and a bunch of other uh, projects around static compilation came out like that. Um, in terms of uh, business models going forward, uh, we do expect to build uh, other pieces of software around Julia uh, that allow uh, that are domain specific and may not necessarily be open source, but help uh, particular industries. Um, you know, get significant amounts of productivity and performance over and above uh, what they're used to. And uh, and we're targeting the world of finance first, but we're seeing a lot of traction in life sciences, um, in the traditional engineering uh, ecosystems, uh, and even in embedded computing, um, or often called the Internet of Things. Okay, thank you everyone for your time. Um, This has been very interesting. We'll have this up soon. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Great. Yeah, thank you. Thank yeah, you. thanks. Yeah, thank you very much.